this is a workshop session. I, I really want to minimize the time that I'm going to be speaking, um, partly because um, it's not like I like the sound of my own voice and I'm certainly not the definitive expert on any of these things. What I rather want to do is work with you and actually hear ideas from you, hear reflections from you. So um, the title is, is a long one. It's worthy of a sort of 17th century novel with a, a, an even longer um, subtitle coming next to it. I've tried to shorten it down a little bit here about focusing on unfinished business to a principles-based framework, thinking not so much about what we do in the very short term, but starting to get you thinking, get your ideas about what could in the future, looking to the horizon, a good copyright framework, the right overall copyright framework for access to and use of our heritage. What does that actually look like? So um, this, come, this presentation, I'm doing so in the context of the Knowledge Rights 21 program, which you've got the, the logo just above me here and a sort of color that makes me look like I'm a bit dead. Um, but the Knowledge Rights 21 program is generously funded by the Arcadia Fund. Um, there's a big focus here on how do we build sustainable capacity within the library field in particular, within allied fields to advocate for copyright reform. Um, this is based on the fact that I think a lot of the time we have, there's a good knowledge of copyright, of what copyright means, of how we need to apply it, how we should apply it, but how can we flip this and turn that knowledge, that experience, those war stories, arguably, into a positive advocacy case for something else. It's obviously about making change happen and the areas that we've picked on within this program, folks, it's on e-lending, it's on contract override, so making sure that licensing terms cannot take away possibilities granted to heritage institutions and others by law open norms, which is going to be the big focus of today. Secondly, publishing rights. So that's the possibility for anyone who has had their research publicly funded immediately to be able to make this research available open access. And then rights retention, again, similarly linked to open access. How can you make sure that authors, their institutions retain rights and publish open access? There's a big focus throughout this on filling evidence gaps as well overcoming the fact that a lot of the time discussions about copyright reforms feel very much, it's more about philosophy and psychology than about evidence. So um, in terms of goals of what I hope that we, we can do here today, I think there's sort of two big ones. Um, the first, as mentioned at the beginning, is, is starting getting your ideas, getting your thinking about what the next big thing could or should be for our sectors when it comes to copyright. And I want to plant the idea that something we should be looking at is a concept of open norms, more flexible approaches to copyright law that focus on principles, not prescriptions. And then the second side of it is to start thinking a little bit and gathering your views on what it is that we need to do to mobilize to get this done. Um, there's going to be a lot of Mentimeter in today's session. So there is a first slide is up there. You will see at the top of the screen, I, I think I'm guessing most of us are pretty familiar with Mentimeter right now, um, but you go to www.menti.com and then you add in the code 69847647. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, but this is a bit of a warming up stage. I want to get a sense of what your relationship status at the moment is with copyright. From leave me alone, from don't touch me with a barge pole to passion. You can see the quickest respondents are the most passionate, but let me give you a cut. Let me give you a little bit of time more. I suppose it's normal if you run a session with copyright in the title, you're probably not going to get the complete copyright phobics. Okay, let's give another sort of 10, 15 seconds and then we'll move on. But this is okay. This is looking this is looking positive. I think I, know, I, I suspect I said this is a not a representative sample of the field, given the title of the session, but it's good to say you know, we've got some passionate people, we've got people who are interested who sort of think about this. I guess what that idea is one of the things I hope that we can get out of this is starting to move people a little bit towards the right a feeling that we can have agency, that we can actually do stuff to change copyright. 
next question, just to sort of begin, get us thinking, is what holds us back most when you're working with copyrighted content? Because there are different aspects in there. There's the law itself, that primary legislation, which is often quite high level, which sets out some very high, I don't know, top level ideas about what is and what isn't possible. There is the fact that sometimes the infrastructure and the protocols that we follow in applying it. And sometimes, to be honest, it's just being scared of copyright, of the impression that copyright is something, it's a minefield, it's somewhere where if you make any mistake, horrible things happen. So let's, this is very good, thank you. Definitely worth renewing our Mentimeter subscription for this. Let's give a couple more minutes. Okay, so it, it, it's pretty close for now. And we've got 15 or so respondents. Maybe there'll be one or two more while I'm just explaining it, talking now. It's pretty well balanced. I think there's an interesting point in there made about the practices and protocols for applying the law. And this is certainly something that we will talk more about in the context of open norms as an approach to what extent, I don't know, ease of application, because in the end, I don't know, laws, they need to work for people, they need to work for us. If they're not easy to apply, if there's not easy ways available to apply them, then they're less effective. So, okay, this is good. This is a good balance of where we are. So, moving on to that, the first part of that title of the state of play, the degree to which we have unfinished business right now. Um, there's quite a lot of EU legislation that affects copyright. I'm conscious uh, that affects how we, as cultural heritage institutions, as the cultural sector, work with copyrighted materials. And um, I know that there will be people in the audience who know this back to front, so I'm going to try not to speak too long about it. I apologize for some of the acronyms that have already slipped in there. It was a choice between having a font that was far too small and getting something bigger where the substance is down there. So um, clearly in European law, we do have rules. These are rules that then carry across to what happens nationally. So. We have, interestingly, in the most in the directive on copyright and the digital single market, we have provisions around criticism, pastiche, quotation, and these are included in particular in the context of what people are allowed to do when they're uploading content to online content sharing service providers. So this is like, you, know, you can upload your book review, in effect, you can upload your critique, your pastiche, it shouldn't be taken down, it shouldn't be receive a copyright strike for that reason. That's interesting because it's a, an obligatory thing, member states have to do this, whereas previously these things were optional. The provisions around out of commerce works, which are designed to make it a lot easier for our institutions to place works that aren't in commerce online, either through seeking a license or where there isn't a collective management organization that is sufficiently representative of rights holders and has the relevant rights under an exception. We have provisions around text and data mining, which are particularly interesting for people working in the digital humanities space. Um, again, these are pretty extensive, these are promising, and they have the benefit of being protected against override by contract terms, by technological protection measures. We have a pretty good, pretty model provision on preservation, at least as concerns works within collections. So this opens up the possibilities for libraries to choose what technology, what approach, and for other heritage associate institutions to choose what approach they want to take in order to preserve. And importantly, especially for people based in smaller countries to work across borders in order to do this. There's also an exception around education, I guess, uh, those people who are involved in it, I think we agree with that, is that it's quite partial, there are pretty big possibilities for opt-outs, but it provides some possibilities, it does provide a, a lead, a cover for actually carrying out education using copyrighted materials, including across borders. We have the much older Information Society Directive from 2001, this also includes a quotation exception, it includes exceptions about education and research, crucially, um, Firstly, this is a directive where um, these provisions are optional, they're not mandatory, um, which creates its own issues. And, and also the way that it was designed meant that there was a sufficient gap in there for the EU to feel that the directive on the digital single market was necessary in order to fill some of those digital gaps. 
We also have the Orphan Works Directive, which obviously is about orphan works. And we have the Open Data Directive, which includes some interesting lines about open access and providing access to research data. Um, it also includes provisions around access to collections, so digitized versions of collections and, and for how long it's possible to exercise rights over those before they're put online. There's the Rental Lending Directive, um, which covers issues around lending of physical books. And since the since the judgment back in 2016, a priori, this applies to the lending of electronic books, but yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of gaps in there and it's not been applied fully. Um, clearly throughout this, just to say there's excellent work that's been done on copyrightexceptions.eu. I encourage you to take a look. It provides a really good overview of where things stand and how some of these European provisions have been applied into national law. It's an excellent piece of work. It's a really well designed piece of work. So I guess that the first question then to come to, and, and we're moving away from easy sort of tick box questions here, is as people involved in the sector, as people who are focused on providing access and enabling use of copyrighted content, of content in your collections, are there any issues that immediately jump out to you as missing from that list that we've had before? And um, I said we've got, um, oh, sorry, I went ahead, apologies hit the button too quickly. Um, again, if you go to Menti, it's the code 69847647. It should be showing up automatically. So I'm going to give you just excellent. Freedom Panorama, absolutely. Okay. So the freedom of panorama was certainly something that was talked about a lot in advance of the in advance of the digital single market directive which i forgot to mention of course does actually say that you know, faithful reproductions of visual arts that's in the public domain should not attract rights which is helpful though obviously that that's referring to works that are in the public domain already um broader scope of exceptions yes and i think that point about broader scope of exceptions brings us on um Copying for any purpose within heritage institutions. Yep, that's a really interesting point. That's a really valuable point. Technical restrictions, definitely that's also something that I won't touch on. I, yeah, we'll touch on that shortly. Reasonable copyright duration, yes. Um, anyone wants to put in an idea of what reasonable copyright duration might be, please go for it. Excellent, someone's guessed what I'm going to be talking about next with border exceptions like fair use. So I think we're already going to be agreeing with each other on that. Except for artistic purposes. Yep, Impro improving wording. 10 years, I, I think, I know, there was a really great study coming out of Australia where they suggested that actually in most cases, copyright doesn't make much sense after five years. And I don't know, the, costs of keeping stuff the eco from economic, from a, a welfare perspective, the costs of keeping things locked up after five years actually started to outbalance the benefits to right holders of keeping them keeping them under, under protection. Excellent registration, duration. Excellent. Okay. This is, I, this is a really good list. I, I, I think clearly, I don't know if these are, I don't know to what extent these come from the same people clearly this this is uh, anonymous but i think we have some of the sort of copyright aficionados feeding in which is excellent okay and um, moving on to the next so just giving some ideas fitting in with this um i don't know a lot of what's said there absolutely um i don't know could argue around all from works and that's a bit of a moot point now given that we have the provisions on out of commerce works However, it's worth underlining that, of course, the out of commerce protect provisions don't provide necessarily for licensing. And so there may still be an interest in a better or from works provision that isn't so difficult to use. Exactly. I think there's talk about technological protection measures. Um, so uh, there's a reference to, so apologies, getting my acronyms mixed up. Um, arguably, the provisions around text and data mining aren't ideal, they are a lot more restrictive potentially when it comes to people looking to come up with new business ideas, looking to actually really build something out of heritage. Um, 
There's not much around web harvesting. Certainly the provisions on preservation focus very strongly on items that are in um, collection, which can't necessarily be said for the internet. And so this is left as a, a big area of question and, and a big sort of doubt. Um, exactly, I think there's, there's the point came up about still that general exception for heritage institutions to do things that's optional under the Information Society Directive. It could be a lot broader and it's very much focused on specific exceptions there. Contracts, we would argue, is a big issue. Um, we know that in most countries, with the honourable exceptions of places like Belgium, Ireland, Montenegro, Portugal, um, contracts still override. And the same goes for technological protection measures. Even if there is technically the possibility to circumvent them, there often isn't actually the, 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 the infrastructure in place to do this. Um, Obviously, an issue that libraries are particularly interested in and that we're focusing on within Knowledge Rights 21 is the rules around e-lending. The fact that actually really the, the, the court decision back in 2016 about saying that lending e-books should operate like it lending physical books has not been applied. Um, maybe it's been a stimulus to agreement, but it's been pretty roundly ignored. And that opens a whole load of questions around whether something like controlled digital lending could be valuable in Europe. And then I think whoever put down, we need an, a more open norm like fair use. Um, yep, that's what we're getting on to. Then there are also some areas where I think we would argue that more can be done on open access because we now have provisions on open data, on research data, but we don't have that firm provision on open access. Um, so moving on to what's been put down as fair use, I think we describe as open norms, given that um, and that that's actually you know, it describes effectively what we're talking about. Um, this was the idea I really wanted to sort of seed a little bit and, and get some reflections on and, and engage thinking on. Um, and I suppose the, the core thing, the core difference between open norms and what you could call closed norms is that they are based on principles, not prescriptions. So um, they are copyright provisions, as it says up on the screen, that positively enable users that can be seen as a usage right, a user's right to do things with works. Um, and they're defined not so much by the specifics of what these things are or the technologies, but rather by a set of principles or factors um, in those countries where it exists. Um, so in Singapore, in Sri Lanka, in Korea, in Israel, in Nigeria now, on the table in South Africa and yep, in the US as well. Um, it can be phrased in different ways. It can be a standalone provision like in the US, or it can be something that's attached to an open-ended list of things that libraries and others or things that users can do in general. And um, I'm not sure how, I don't know, this is often seen as an American term and, and, and we'll get on to Americanism and anti-Americanism in, in a little bit, but um, I suppose the, the next question that I wanted to put to you is, is to ask you, I don't know, what benefits you think there could be, I don't know, from your understanding of taking such an approach? So again, I'm gonna go open, go over to you. Just, just to give a sense of what, what, what's coming up. So we have, there'll be this, there'll be a slide about downsides, and then I'm actually going to open up because it would be really good to have people talking about it, you know, the answers they're giving now, but I'll also ask the question of, of how do you go about defining fairness? And of course, feel free to, feel free to use the definitions that already exist, the, 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 the means of doing this that already exist. So absolutely. I think that flexibility is important so you're not tying yourself down. And of course, this is heavily linked to the fact that obviously changing law is slow. And, and I think as we've seen with copyright directive a couple of years ago, it's painful as well. Space for innovation is useful. And that point about more extensive reuse, exactly, that, that I mean, it provides a stronger protection, arguably. Consistency is an interesting point here. I think we'll, we'll, we'll come on to the counter arguments shortly, but 
absolutely more sharing. And yeah, that point about avoiding and holding yourself hostage, avoiding believing that legislators and civil servants are the ones that can, can read into the future, that can actually tell what's going to be needed or not. An interesting point about shielding some content from open access, I guess, I don't know, I'd be, interested, I'd, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more from the person who made that point if they feel willing to do so. I think that's, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, okay, let, let's go on to the next question, just on, on the downsides, because I don't know, obviously there are, there is opposition to this, there's, there's a sense for many this isn't something that would work and it's always important to consider these views and understand them. So this next question is the possible downsides. Uncertainty is definitely one of the points that's made. A little bit longer. There's only what's a one downside. That's obviously a good thing. Oh, there we go. Hey, there we go. No other downsides. It's great. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. I think that, that that point about compliance is an interesting one. I think it raises a lot of questions about. It may, you know, there's a pretty fundamental question about yeah, the, I don't know, the line between the law and the enforcement of the law. Okay, oh, that's an interesting point about potential low interoperability. So I guess, I think what, what I'd be keen to do now actually is but before sort of trying to, to preempt things by sharing my next slide, I'd be interested to get a sense from from those in the audience. I know it's pretty clear, and hopefully, of course, that you know, you, you, you you're already thinking about this. I know you probably looked at what goes on in the states, but importantly, what goes on elsewhere. Um, it would be interesting just to get a little bit more. I don't know. I don't know if anyone's willing to take up the mic to talk about this, and I think I might throw in another question here of of. If we're talking about principles, actually, what should those principles be? What what in your thought, I don't know, you can be led by the four principles in the US and they're also used in Nigeria and Singapore and in the draft South African law. Um, does anyone want to sort of talk through, I don't know, their, their, their ideas, their views on the some of the comments they've made? I think there's people in the room with microphones, I've been reassured. And if there are people who are of the 33 participants online, please do add things in the chat and I will read them out. Any hands up in the audience? I have a slight sound from another microphone. I don't know. If... Hi, Stephen. Oh, hey. Hi, this is Ariana. Um, I was just thinking the same as, uh, like, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm asked to stand up, even though you cannot see that. <laughs> but, oh, I, I, I can. You're, you're being zoomed in on, even. <laughs> ah, okay, great. Okay. <laughs> I was just thinking, uh, why not the same as uh, fair use? To me, they, they seem quite good. That's it. Yep. So I, I think you, you're completely right, I guess. I suppose to put it cynically, um, there is a lot of, how to put it, I think it, 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 it's sometimes difficult to sort of differentiate between the symbolism of the term fair use and what it actually means. Because I don't know, the, the words fair use are, know, the words fair use, it's pretty obvious, it is use that is fair. But I think, I don't know, it's become so politicized and it's been so heavily used to mean something that it evidently doesn't, 
that um, it feels slightly more helpful actually to sort of move away from that and say that we're actually, you know, we're talking about open norms. So it, it's semantics rather than anything else. I, I think I know what I will do is actually I will, um, I will go on to the next slide, but I do, will actually come back to this because there's some use, there's some really helpful things in here. Um, I think also a big element in here is that um, we do face often a sense of what is American is not necessarily helpful. I don't know, appealing to anti-Americanism and appealing to um, negative views of certain American companies um, becomes quite a powerful tool for trying to knock down or reject any sort of copyright reform. I don't know, it, it is part of the playbook. And so to the extent that fair use is seen as a purely American thing, I don't think it's necessarily helpful for us to, to, to talk about fair use per se, rather open norms as something that is, and it, ex, ex, it explains what it is, but rather than having closed norms, we're having open norms. I, I hope that sort of answers the question in some way, but I think okay, the point is well taken. I'm just not, I'm always sort of concerned that simply talking straight about fair use or, or reaching straight for the American terminology just sends up, everyone forgets what the, what the words actually mean and goes directly to their sort of the concept they have in their head or the sets of ideologies that they have in their heads. I was going to go back to the previous slides, actually, because I think, especially on this one, there's some really interesting points, which I think are actually it's more interesting than what I had on my slide, which is, I think, a success as far as I'm concerned. I think there's an interesting <clears throat> point in there about how fair use can be seen as an excuse or something that I don't know, people use as a defense without thinking again that question about what actually fair use means. I, I, I know that. There's a lot of talk about fair use in the context of the South African reforms, where the impression has been given that fair use becomes a, a, a fair use, that open norms becomes a right to take an in-copyright textbook and copy it thousands of times. Um, I think you know, and that is an incredibly uncharitable reading of how people act. It's a very sort of, I don't know, it, 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 there's a risk in there that that you, know, you assume that everyone is naturally a, a pirate, um, which is, I don't think is the case. Um, at the same time, it's clear that, I know, this comes out in the points about uncertainty as well. A lot, I know, with any copyright law, probably then comes down to people's attitudes and applying it and the combination of sort of understanding they have of the explicit text of the law, and the, the, the attitude and how, how cavalier, how sort of risk-taking, how responsible or responsible they want to be. Um, I guess, I know, it's not as if piracy doesn't exist in regimes without fair use. Um, it definitely seems, you know, it seems to exist everywhere, even especially in those countries that have very limited exceptions and very closed exceptions to copyright. So drawing a line between the two is there. At the same time, and these are ideas, these are I don't know, points that we need to be able to address, that we need to find solutions to, or at least I don't know, find alternative solutions to, to the extent that they are, they're actually backed up by fact. Um, I'm interested really about the points about low interoperability and the divergence of interest between member states. I think, I think that that's, it's, it's a really interesting point because it's true that there aren't that many fair use countries out there or countries with open norms out there at the moment. It's, I don't know if someone could expand more because I know it's a really interesting point. It's something that I know that working for an international library organization, we think about a lot and we get sort of worried about a lot of this, this lack of interoperability. Is anyone willing to take the microphone? Okay, well, I, I, the other point, you know, as I, I will pause again in a second, just in case the, the, a hand goes up. I think that point about creating a more confusing landscape for users is, is another interesting one. It, it's true that 
if you are a busy person with um, not much brain space in order to deal with complexity, it can be far easier to be told very explicitly that this is a good thing to do and this is a bad thing to do. That that's understandable. That's sort of human nature. Um, and so yes, I mean, there is a point in there that I don't know, fair use is only as good as as the use that people make of it. Open norms are only as good as the use that people make of it. It's perfectly possible to have a, a country with a an open norm, but where nonetheless no one's willing to actually test with it, and they will just go off and license or say no to things anyway. So I think that's that there's a point in there that that lack of explicit and the lack of being explicit is something that I don't know means that an open norm on its own doesn't necessarily do the job. Any additional sort of questions or points or, or people willing to sort of um, elaborate on the points that they put down about the, the benefits of an open norm or the risks of an open norm? Hello. Oh, hello. That was good. Hello. Well, caught. well caught. Well, thank you. <laughs> that was all. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about two things. So first, I was thinking about the point you were just making about uncertainty. And I was thinking, well, actually, yep, I agree. Um, the sort of broader and more generalized your, your wording and your framework, the more chance there is for uncertainty. But uh, we've got, you know, limited uh, defined exceptions at the moment in discrete areas. Uh, and there's plenty of uncertainty. So actually, I would, in a way, not be worried about, I'm not worried about the uncertainty at all. You know, I think about exceptions for quotation or, or um, text and data mining, whatever else they might be, there's still extreme uh, variation, how you might interpret what those mean and how you'd use them in particular situations. And I spend a lot of my time uh, talking to my colleagues about different interpretations of exceptions as they stand. So there's tons of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So I think that doesn't introduce a lot, for me, uh, new concern. And the other thing I was thinking in a more general sense um, was about, you know, when you talk about the principles, is kind of element of the three-step test from the Berne Convention where you kind of talk about uh, not infringing on the reasonable expectations of the copyright owners. And I think to me that's probably one of the most fundamental principles to, to go with, in a, whether it's an open norm or not. I mean, the first principle of the three-step test is you should have limited ex and defined exceptions. So maybe that's more of a problem. But in terms of dealing, you know, with a work in a way that is not going to kind of step on the toes, if you like, of the people who who have legitimate interest in the material seems very logical to me. And it's, it's, it is a very open, loose principle. And I think it would change a lot, you know, depending on the, the currency or, or, or economic viability of the item they're using, for example, or what you're trying to do with it. But it's, it's very broad. But it seems like a very concrete principle to me that that's what you'd want to be looking at. Kind of whether, frankly, something's in copyright or not, you don't really want to be doing something that's going to, to harm someone else with content. So I think that that would be a good principle. I, I think no, you, you're absolutely right there. And, and despite the impression that's sometimes given about fair use, that is, I don't know, at, at least from what you hear from the states, that's actually that the impact, the substitution effect of a use is probably actually the single most important thing that's taken into account when you're trying to judge fairness. And so that that's why accusations that it, it, it that bringing in an open norm in South Africa would lead to the destruction of textbook markets are a, a bunkum it, it, it's just it's just not true it is a fabrication you know it, it's shameful to be making that sort of argument to be honest because it's just wrong um, and and so you know you're absolutely right that that feeds in there I don't know fair use as a whole it, it, it's not been challenged on the three-step test. I don't know. I think there's there's the exception acceptance within the regional comprehensive economic partnership in Asia that fair use is compatible with the three-step test. And I think full stop the three-step test as a principles-based approach to copyright. I don't know. It shows it can be done. You don't have to define everything in terms of specifics. You have principles there. Um, Obviously, how you use the three-step test, you use it to sort of scare people off or to enable them is another debate to have. And um, I, I, I will hurry on actually because I know I, I think yeah, there's a really there's an interesting thing coming up. I hope I hope it's interesting. I think it's interesting. Um, so just I don't know a couple of the ideas that you often hear. I know everyone's covered. Let's need to update laws. Legislation doesn't go out of date. You know, I, I'd argue that given that the idea of copyright is to find a balance it makes sense to have i don't know a bicycle that i don't know if, if you do not
not move on a bicycle, you fall off. And so the importance of being able to move in order to maintain balance is kind of important. I don't know if the handlebars are stuck, then you fall off as well. Um, concerns over legal action, that's often cited as a thing, but I, I don't know we have copyright lawyers in civil law countries. It's not as if the law never gets challenged or never gets changed. So I think, again, the point you were making there about there's plenty of uncertainty when you try and be prescriptive. Um, concerns over overuse, and that's been made a lot. I think, I don't know, if people, I know, people who genuinely are out to do, to, 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 to commit, to do things that go beyond piracy, of course, may use this as an excuse. I don't know, it's not what's intended by the law. If it's straight up piracy, it's straight up piracy. And then I guess the point at the end, which you know, I, I always feel as an issue, is, is it's harking to, it's drawing on anti-Americanism that does exist and, and cynicism about countries that begin with Gs, As or Fs, um, uh, and, and, and claiming that, well, if something is good for them, then we must stop it. Um, I think there's an element of that in there, and, and you see references made, which I think, I don't know, we may not like it more than anyone else, but it would be to, to, to cut off our noses to spite our faces, to simply oppose things purely because they are damaged, because they would be, not, might be any sort of benefit to other companies. Um, so I guess the, the, the next thing, I don't know, we have there. Something that's desirable, that's something to look at. Um, and one is think about what are the capacities, how do we build up that sustainable capacity to do advocacy. We're going to go from an overly exciting slide to an example of terrible PowerPoint practice here. Um, but to explain what this is, and I, I'll share a link to the, the, the slideshow with the organizers later so that, that you can sort of share this and look into it. Um, it's trying to think about anyway, how we do advocacy and in particular how we do advocacy, how do we try and change laws and policies and practices around, around copyright and around open access um, effectively. And I think a key part of this is accepting that Advocacy is not just lobbying, clearly lobbying is important, but it's only one end of a pretty big spectrum that goes from grassroots mobilization, that goes from being able to identify stories, identify human examples that can really reach out to people, collect data, and prove what we're saying. Um, and I guess we sort of see, you know, this is a bit of thinking that we've, we've tried to do internally on, um, <clears throat> what are the different elements of advocacy? You know, what are the different sort of capabilities that are involved in trying to help people become more effective and trying to help communities at the national level, at the European level, become more effective in trying to change laws and trying to change some of the mindsets to challenge some of the ideas that there are around introducing more openness into our copyright laws in the interests of greater sharing, in the interests of greater access to and use of heritage collections. Um, we've broken down into eight um, different sort of types of area, different capabilities, um, starting with know, understanding the landscape. So having that, that legal understanding, but also having a sense of how decisions are made, how do you feed in, you know, what are the opportunities that you have to actually get involved there. Um, coordinating, because I know if you're going to campaign, you need to be able to plan for campaigning. Mobilizing people, and as I said, advocacy has to be, needs to be more than about just having one person in a nice suit in the capital or whatever who is able to go in and see the officials. Clearly that's important, but it's so much more powerful when we can talk about the experience of users, the experience of our colleagues in libraries, archives, museums, et cetera, all across countries um, showing that we have that local reach. Gathering evidence, um, I said, yeah, being able to actually produce data, produce those stories that make an impact. Communicating it effectively. Um, again, whereas lobbying may have to buff behind closed doors, it's always powerful when you can actually use communications to show that there is a need to reform, and in particular to show that there is a cost to not reforming. 
Um, the more the purer lobbying side of things, building relations with decision makers. Um, it is, I can put cynically, getting to know their children's names, getting to know, I know what, what they're interested in, getting to the stage where they will actually contact us and, and be sort of, I don't know, that we have their confidence that they will let us know that they will champion the sorts of things that we're trying to do. Um, building advocacy partnerships. Um, that's working with like-minded organizations because we're certainly not alone. I come from the library sector and so already being here at Europeana is, is it's a really powerful thing. And we're among like-minded groups of people that how can we actually work across our sectors in the interest of promoting reform? Um, how can we look beyond at the digital rights community at the student community and so on? And finally, evaluation of advocacy at the bottom. I hope that my toolbar isn't blocking that because it is on my screen. Um, evaluation, obviously setting your goals in the first place, but then being able, and then going back, looking at how you've achieved them, using that to draw lessons. Um, and so now we're going to go on to the next um, slide, uh, the next Menti slide. And this is probably the single most complicated one on here, for which I apologize, but you will be asked to agree or strongly agree to strongly disagree to the question of how well placed you feel that, that you are to do these things. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit longer to do this one because it's a little bit more complicated. And um, it will involve, if you're doing this on your phone, I'm sorry, it will involve scrolling. Congratulations to the first respondent, okay. It looks like a cell that's about to multiply. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit longer. I'm, I'm conscious, of course, throughout this by going for averages. We're sort of, I don't know, we're, we're, we're diluting some of the information that's coming in, but and I'll talk a little bit more about using that grid in a minute. Okay, let's give another 30 seconds or so, 14 responses in so far. Okay, 15. So I, I guess, no, I said, no, we're working with averages here. So I think we're diluting things, but I think we're already coming out of here, at least I know, the, the group in the room, I know we are uh, communicators to a large extent with a decent background in copyright. And interestingly, you know, the, the lowest, points on this are, it's about evaluating impact, I don't know, to be honest, I know, I know but it's something that we need to work on, it's something that's easily forgotten. Um, those points about mobilizing the field is interesting. I know there's always a risk that with copyright, people end up being seen as being Mrs. or Mr. Copyright, and so sort of left on their own while everyone else goes and do other things. And so the idea of trying to make this into a mass mobilization thing isn't easy. We do see some very good examples obviously things like people and soper back in 2012 but things like the ebook sos campaign in the uk at the moment um interesting also that, that there's a relatively low result on building relationships so we feel easier communicating out and doing things publicly but actually making links and um, i suppose i don't know the whole point of the grid and, and you probably would have understood this and, and this is it's a concept that we've completely stolen from the council of europe language framework and from unesco and others is to, to look across and think about in which areas are we strong and which areas are we less strong partly in order to think about where do we need to strengthen what we're doing where do we need to focus on building our skills and our capacities but i think actually almost more is thinking about how you can pair up how you can draw on different people's respective strengths in order to become more effective in advocating for fair use. 
I don't know, I'm just going to go back to the previous slide here. I don't know if anyone sort of has has responses or reactions to that, I don't know, look, looking through in terms of how they scored or how you, you sort of self-assessed on, on, on those eight different capabilities. I don't know if, if, if anything sort of comes to mind or any immediate priorities for action or priorities for partnerships come to mind. I have my eye on the big blue cube, which I can just about see on the right of the screen. I'm conscious that this is a bit, this breaks one of the cardinal rules of PowerPoint that you need to keep everything above a certain font size. <laughs> but no, it, it, it's available online. Um, I said, a key idea here is that you know, when we're thinking about copyright advocacy, I said, it's a variety of things we can draw together, a variety of people, we can form coalitions, partnerships, um, campaigns together in order to get things done. Um, so I think, I know, we'll get, coming towards the end, I know, we've talked a little bit about you know, what open norms are, the, the principles that should sort of underpin them. Um, we've talked about some of the arguments for, but I think really importantly, why are there hesitations? Why are there doubts? Because, you know, to the extent that doubts are legitimate, they need to be addressed. That, you know, it, it's, and I think the point made that, you know, fair use should absolutely not become, should, shouldn't necessarily be a free for all. It's always worth, I don't know, it's always worth remembering that, you know, there are many reasons not for giving access to things around privacy, around the interests of indigenous groups. Um, copyright is definitely not the only factor in play here, and, and we shouldn't ever look to give the impression that is the only thing that matters. And um, so I think bringing it together, this is the, the, the final sort of open question I have is, what do you think actually the first steps might be towards, for you, first steps on becoming more competent, becoming more effective in your own views, and in actually moving towards trying to make an open norm seem like something that we can go for in Europe and something that we can see as a, a positive, a potential thing. So that's sometimes my computer is sensitive and sometimes it is not sensitive. This time it was sensitive. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to sort of type in your answers there. I know it's an open question. There's some really good ideas coming in here. I think there's a really interesting points there about transparency, about the use of exceptions. I think it's, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I don't know that, that it partly makes sense. I think, I don't know, and you, you can see this in terms of, I don't know, this could be read in two ways. It could obviously be read in the way of, our organization sort of going too far with exceptions, but I think also there's a pretty crucial thing that, that you know, copyright exceptions are, I don't know, that they're, they're not necessarily something to be ashamed of. They are something that is in the law in order to achieve a goal. And so actually showing that we are using them and showing that you know, we're making the most of them and, and using and delivering on the public interest goals that they are intended to, that they have been created in order to actually deliver on. I think also potentially it's, it's an interesting point in terms of sharing examples and building confidence in using things and also moving towards shared ways or shared understandings of what is possible, either under current exceptions or under open norms in due course. I like the interesting point about collaborating with like-minded. I think that point about evidence, absolutely, that um, being able to understand where there are gaps, where there are frustrations. Um, I think and arguably, you know, the, the shift to digital has been a, a big call for reform. I don't know, it's been a big call for actually a big reason to think about whether copyright frameworks are working or not. I think we've seen in countries that do have that do have open norms that have fair use, such as the US, there have been initiatives like the, the, the Hattie Trust 
um, which has effectively provided a form of, of, of entirely secure digital lending for libraries, which have allowed simply, thanks to fair use, have, have, have made it possible for libraries to continue to serve users in a controlled way, in a secure way during the pandemic. So I think looking at those examples and understanding why is that possible in the US? What's when you, what are the limitations? What are the positives there? Um, yeah, pushing the boundaries of current exceptions. Um, I think, yes, that point about fearing, fearing risk is, I mean, it comes back to that point about um, it's normal if you have very little time, if you have very little you know, energy or appetite for risk, then it's normal to, to want to have something that's less, um, it's normal to want to have something that is, that is, is more descriptive, that's more prescriptive. There's an argument that I don't know. Fair use only works if you have a sort of psychological revolution in favour of a more risk-positive attitude. Um, does anyone want to talk to any of these points? Because I'm conscious. I'm my goal here was not to hear myself talk too much. So. The blue cube is not moving. <laughs> Uh, hi, Stephen. It's Maya. Um, so I think I just wanted to stress the point of the the importance of gathering evidence that will help us. Uh, coming back also to your previous question about the the advocacy work, it's all it's a lot about being in dialogue with the right people, but and it's a lot about telling the right kind of stories, and to be able to persuade them. So I'm trying to use and to make them understand. I'm trying to use all the words that we have on the screen here. And for this, I really believe we need to have those stories in place. So really to gather evidence for me would be the step one. And based on that, on them, especially if they are shared, especially if we can have first the discussion among ourselves, um, yeah, the advocates, then I would say this would be the, the step one. And then we can go and have those conversations. So I think as a comment. I, I, I can only agree with that. I think you know, arguably this could be part of reflective practice where actually you know, in just the same way as it is a, a positive thing to be able to look back at what you have done and assess it and, and evaluate, being able to look back and keep a record of what is working, what isn't working and, and simply use that fact. You know, the fact that you know, we, we are, the sector is, is, you know, is, is I don't know, we're working in big sectors that have a lot of experience, that have a lot of contact day to day with working with copyright material. And so there is that huge bank of experience that we could be drawing on, this huge bank of evidence that we could be drawing on if we can just marshal it and persuade people to see their experience as evidence, which I think a lot of the time people just don't necessarily see their own experience as evidence, but it is, it's valuable. I don't know, um, people working in the heritage sector, people working with these materials, you know, it, it's, we're all working towards a public interest. I don't know what we're doing is, is, is valuable, it's worth supporting, it's worth allowing to happen. Are there any other points on the floor, any other points in the chat? Is, I think we've still got... I think there's, yes, so there's definitely a, a, yeah, a useful point in there about the balancing between protection and access. Um, I think yes, I think that it, it's that's that's a really crucial one. I guess uh, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that we definitely need to avoid being portrayed, and we need to avoid giving the impression that um, whether something is copyrighted or not, and whether an exception or a usage right applies or not, is the only reason why we might do anything. It is one of the reasons why we might do everything. You know, copyright is certainly not the be all and end all here. Okay, um, so I'm going to just, just end, moving towards the end, we've only got three minutes, um, and I know this is sort of the mid-afternoon stage and you're all in a sort of dark room in what I remember as being comfortable chairs, which is always, is, yep, <laughs> is always a big ask. Um, so just to say what we're certainly trying to do with Nardwarts 21, I said at the beginning, it's a mixture of I don't know, trying to build those communities. So 
drawing on that experience, drawing on that evidence that you were mentioning, Maya, there, um, and bringing together people with those different skill sets, with those different abilities to become effective. Um, one thing we are looking to do is to find people within each country um, in Europe who are interested, who feel like they can I know, make that happen and get people together, organize them, add skills that may be missing. Um, we'll be making some announcements soon on countries where these are filled, but I know, keep a look on the Knowledge Rights 21 website and we will update on, on where we are shortly. Um, the deadline's getting a bit late, but we're also making money available in order to support work at the national level to, to fill evidence gaps and to fill gaps in our ability to communicate what it is that the heritage sector needs. Um, one of the goals being around um, open norms and promoting this idea that that sort of flexibility, that openness, that focus on principles rather than prescription is a, a good thing, is an acceptable thing, is a manageable thing. Um, building up those national networks, I'd certainly encourage anyone here who is interested to, to, to get in touch and there'll be an email on the next page. Hopefully my colleague Matt Voigt is also in the room and will identify himself. If he is, please do sort of share your cards or share your emails with him. And then I think, again, coming back to that point from my sharing those examples, I don't know, as I said, you, your experience and you know, the people in the sector are doing things that are important that matter. And if these are being held back, it's important to think about whether these are, is this for a good reason? Or not, and if it's not for good reason, let, let's go out and try and change it, and, and then pull together those examples, pull together that evidence. So, um, with that, I have got to the. Oh, that was. I've got to the end of the thing. I was going to go to that one. Um. So yeah. So. So as I said, if, if I think Matt should be in the room, if not, um, please do contact us. It's info at knowledgerights21.org. I can put that in the chat as well. But then. In the sort of minute or so that's left, if there are any, oh no, I think we have come to the end. I will let the moderator decide if we have time for questions or not. Thank you, Stephen. I can confirm your colleague is here and has risen his hand, so we all have identified him. <laughs> Thanks, um, Matt. <laughs> so thank you very much, Stephen. I just wanted to check before we finish. Does anyone have any last uh, comments or questions for Stephen? If you you can raise your hand here or uh, put it in the chat if you're online. Yes, we have a question here. One moment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This is a bit weird. Hi, it's Annie. Hi. Um, my question or just thoughts were thinking about evidence gathering mm. and the like. Uh, so where I work and my experience is that rights data is not top of the bill when it comes to my organization's priorities at all <laughs> and uh, we do mass digitization projects and things and a lot of metadata is created but not necessarily for rights um, and so we're always left with this kind of uh, well just not enough information so if you're thinking about how to try and gather more data about what you're doing with your collections, whether they're in copyright, out of copyright, if you're taking risk approach to them, what can you, what can we do to support organisations to actually start building that up as part of the sort of everyday work? Because having that data will then help onwards. Um, I mean, remember, Fed might remember this when we were talking to the UK IPO about the effectiveness of the UK's orphan work schemes, and we were all sending them information about how we license this kind of work and basically saying that we never pay anyone for it anyway. So, um, but they weren't accepting that as evidence, which was a bit weird because we were all institutions telling them this is how it is, but it's not accepted. Um, so um, yeah, it's not, maybe it's a question, maybe it's just a observation, but um, just rights data tends to, in my experience, be left behind when you're talking about, meta, you know, technical metadata, descriptive metadata, lots of other things and then rights just sort of is in as in the case would be at the moment 500 different spreadsheets um but nowhere is it getting codified and saved as part of legacy data thank you so yeah thank you i, I the, the the entire library field salutes you for underlining <laughs> the importance of actually getting your metadata correct um yeah, yeah yes i mean there's a 
I don't know, we, we can argue that, you know, that there's maybe a, a bit of a contradiction in the fact that you know, we don't focus enough on data, but then we still get scared of copyright when actually collecting data would be a good way of reducing that. I, I suppose at the same time, it also underlines that you know, it goes back to the point about you know, what is manageable, what is, is usable, and I, don't know, I suppose at least with as a norms approach, you are more explicitly focused. I mean, you are focusing a little bit more on risk and actually taking an educated judgment. But I, I don't know. I think full stop. And the projects like right statements and so on, which are looking to make this easier. There's probably all the work that goes across IFLA and other library organisations to work on this. It would certainly be helpful. I think if you just understand what understanding what's going on and gathering data. For Thank you, Stephen. I think we'll have to draw yeah, uh, the discussions to a close now. Sorry, I, I over spoke over you. I, I thought you had finished. Um, so I'm sure these discussions will continue, not least in European Network's uh, copyright community. But I'd like to thank everyone here in the room and, and ask you to show your appreciation for Stephen. Thank you.